In Luke 13, Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, will there be many who are saved? And Jesus responded by saying, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Jesus tells us that many will seek to enter and not be able to. He uses this analogy of the master of a house where people come, they knock on the door, they want to enter, but he's locked the door and they say, Lord, open to us. And he says, I don't know you. We understand, therefore, that salvation has something to do with knowing Christ. This tells us that salvation implies a previous relationship with Christ, that there must be a prior knowing of Him. How then do we know Jesus? How do we recognize Him and how do we have a relationship with Jesus? The people in Jesus' example say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. In other words, they assumed that they knew Him. Does this mean that it's possible that we also may assume that we know Him but actually don't? How do we know somebody? Let's say, for example, you get on the elevator and there's a complete stranger there and you are standing shoulder to shoulder to them. You don't know that person, but there's physical proximity. There can be a familiarity with Christ without the knowledge of Christ, just as there can be a closeness of proximity with a complete stranger on an elevator. Years ago, I was in Nashville. I was shopping with my family and a very famous country music singer was there at the grocery store and she had on sunglasses and people started lining up for her autograph and she looked at me and saw my kids and smiled at my kids. But I don't have any relationship with her. Say for example, I was to see her years later and to say, hey, do you remember me? I'm that person in the grocery store. You smiled at my kids. She would say, I don't know you. It's not meant personally. It's just there's no pre-existing relationship. The disciples walked with Jesus for three years, and yet, at the end of Jesus' ministry, they all abandoned Him. It wasn't until they were born again and filled with the Spirit that they actually began to really know Jesus for who He is. That's not to say that the natural information that they learned from walking and living with Jesus those three years was unnecessary or unimportant. But natural knowledge alone is insufficient. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And in verse 16, he says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. What Paul means then is that we don't know Christ through a human familiarity, but we know him spiritually by the Spirit. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. He goes on in verse 17 by saying, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There must therefore actually be a real relationship with Jesus Christ, not just information that we've memorized about Him, facts and details about the life of Jesus, which are essential and important. Those details are not enough. We must have an actual knowing of Christ spiritually. In Jesus' example in Luke 13, the people who are seeking to enter presume that they knew Jesus, but He tells them, on the contrary, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, I do not know you. What is a worker of iniquity? Inequity is injustice. Equity or justice is a righteousness that is self-evident. It's different from the law, which is God's supernatural revelation. There are two ways that we can know right and wrong. One is, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, that even the unbeliever intuitively knows right from wrong because God has written it in our hearts. Even though that we're fallen, we intuitively know certain things are right and wrong. And we appeal to that unspoken standard of right and wrong. If somebody cuts in line, you say, hey, wait your turn. Where does that come from? It comes from just an intuitive sense of fairness. Fairness or equity then is written on the heart of man. Of course, we can't be saved by God's general revelation. We need the special revelation of Jesus Christ. God has revealed himself through the scriptures, especially, and ultimately through his son, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came into the world to save sinners. God's law is his revealed righteousness. So there are two types of iniquity. There are lawbreakers, who Jesus refers to in Matthew 7, and there are those workers of iniquity who just do what is wrong despite the fact that God has written what is right in their hearts. Jesus says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he told the people that they would see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom, but they themselves would be thrust out. It's because the Pharisees and the religious community of Jesus' day, by and large, they were following a legalistic righteousness, but they lacked the equity, the justice, the righteousness that comes from an inner life that has been reconciled to God. 
When a person is born again, there is to be a change in their nature. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. That means that God restores to us not only relational intimacy with God, but that restoration of relational intimacy causes a change in our inner nature so that we are able now through the new nature to be equitable, to be fair, to be righteous from the inside. And this is what Jesus said. The Bible says that God requires truth in the inward parts. By contrast, in Matthew 25, Jesus gives a parable about the sheep and the goats. Jesus contrasts the two, sheep and goats. The sheep are those that ministered to him. He says, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will respond by saying, when did we do these things to you? In other words, there was an unconscious doing of these things. There wasn't a recognition that they were doing them to Jesus, but they were doing these things for the right reasons. If we do the right things, but we do them for the wrong reasons, the Bible calls that hypocrisy. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, therefore, Jesus gives us another example of people who didn't necessarily recognize Jesus in the sense that they didn't recognize they were doing those things to him. Nevertheless, Jesus accredits their deeds as though they were done to Jesus. This is in part what it means to live in the new nature. It also means that Jesus, in effect, is saying to the sheep, you did recognize me. By contrast to those in Luke 13, he's saying to them, you thought you knew me, you thought you recognized me, but you didn't. Thank you.